Now, over the 20-year period between 2003 and 2023, the Public Health Collaboration from the UK identified 71 randomised control trials comparing low-carb and low-fat diets in terms of weight loss. Out of those 71, 39 found a statistically significant difference between the two groups. In other words, the findings weren't likely to be due to random chance. And here, I present the results of these 39 randomised control trials. What we'll note is that in every single randomised control trial, with significant results, the low-carb arm did better. Could there be a clearer repudiation of the low-fat for weight loss dogma? What perhaps is even more amazing is that to many of you here in the audience today, this will be news, and it shouldn't be. The science is crystal clear. If you're interested, here are the individual references for each paper shown on the graph. Or perhaps you might be interested in reading one of the more than a dozen meta-analyses on the topic. The point is, the science is in. And as doctors, we should be more concerned with science than guidelines written by organisations with commercial partnerships with the likes of Kellogg's and Nestle. And by that, I am of course referring to the Australian Dietary Guidelines, the current edition of which was developed by the Dietitians Association of Australia. There is also the claim that we need to consume 130 grams of carbohydrates daily to fuel our brain. This was established and widely publicised in this 2002 Institute of Medicine report. It was based on research that showing that the brain, on average, could metabolise 100 grams of glucose a day. Another 30 grams was added as a fudge factor. The problem is the ability of the brain to use glucose is not the same as the need to metabolise glucose. It's quite possible for the brain to function, as mine is today, on very low carbohydrate diets. Pioneering metabolic researcher George Cahill took three subjects who had been fasted for several weeks, meaning they already had very low glucose levels. And then he infused them with 20 units of insulin over a 24-hour period. As you can see, the average glucose levels dropped to less than 1.5 millimoles a litre. One subject even went below one. And these subjects all remained completely asymptomatic. The reason being obvious when you look at the ketone levels. Ketones simply replace glucose as a source of energy for the brain. There is no obligate need for dietary carbohydrate. Of course, I would caution you about letting your patients adopt a ketogenic diet immediately prior to surgery. The process of keto adaptation takes at least two weeks and ideally four. There is another question regarding fat consumption, especially saturated fat. You may be concerned that while a high fat diet may help your patients lose weight, it may not be good for their cardiovascular health. The Australian Dietary Guidelines, after all, recommend that we limit our intake of saturated fat. The guidelines claim there is clear evidence that saturated fat increases the risk of cardiovascular disease. This, however, may be one of the biggest lies in nutrition. First of all, saturated fat is not a strong determinant of increased LDL. This study looked at the impact of these three fats with olive oil, 19% saturated fat, butter, 66% saturated fat, and coconut oil chock full at 94% saturated fat. Not only did coconut oil containing 94% saturated fat not increase serum LDL, it lowered it by more than even olive oil. The fact is there are no proven mechanisms by which saturated fat can increase LDL. It's never been shown, yet somehow it has ended up as an indisputable accepted fact. 